Now, in that framework, three men have created the modern awareness of, 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 of quality. Dr. Deming, of course, and then, and then Dr. Duran and Dr. Crosby. Very different people. Deming and Duran, Duran's still alive, but is also now in his late 80s. Deming died a, a year ago. Uh, and Crosby is, about, is, is much younger, he's a generation younger. Crosby was the, quali was the real popularizer. He wrote a book called Quality is Free, which was a bestseller, and which basically argues that, that quality actually lowers your costs and improves. And, and it was Crosby's book which led Millikan to Deming. Because uh, Dem uh, Millikan said he read Crosby's book, one, and, and Crosby says something like, 20 to 30 percent of what you're doing is waste. And if you can simply cut out the waste, you increase your profit by 20 to 30 percent. And since he owned the company, he stopped and said, wait a second. This is an enormous amount of money. Well, think about your own life. If you could literally combine Drucker and Deming and improve your daily effectiveness 20 to 30 percent, how much would that over a year impact? Don't you mark the force quality issue? No. You Not if everybody's equally mediocre. <laughs> it's true. I mean, the, and you, we're going to get to this in a minute, but it's true. You can have an entire, I mean, look at a third world country. They have a market. But the market forces a bowl of rice, not McDonald's. Because, because quality is not forced. Quality is created. Now, the market then can discern quality. The market can't invent quality. We're going to get to that in just a minute, but it's a very big difference. What the market will do is at a given level of quality, it will choose the better over the worse. But it will not raise the level of quality. It takes leadership to raise quality. Doesn't that encourage quality in itself? Yes, it does encourage it over time. If, if you know how to think systemic, if you grow up in a civilization which teaches you to think systematically. But it doesn't encourage it over time if you don't, and you'll see this in just a minute. But, I mean, again, imagine there were no cookbooks, and you said you went to the place that most, that most frequently actually cooked the egg. But since there were no cookbooks, it was random. You hire a cook, you say, cook the egg. They haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Okay? The first step is, this is the recipe. This is the stove. This is how we wash the dishes. And then you begin to improve. And then ultimately you get to Ray Kroc's invention of McDonald's, which is one of the great breakthroughs of, 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 of consumer culture. Or Coca-Cola, the invention of Coca-Cola in the late 1880s, early 1890s. But it took somebody to invent it. Once it's invented, quality drives out non-quality. But until it's invented and begins to be the new accepted standard for the market, you stay at whatever level you were at before. Now, the thing that's fascinating to me about profound knowledge in Deming's model is that it has deep American roots. It has the work ethic, basic honesty, basic decency, self-respect and respect for others. It has teamwork, think of a wagon train, pragmatism, trying to achieve the aim, and personal responsibility. The only way you get all these, if you know, and this, this was very striking to me when we first designed the course. I see the entire personal responsibility two hours as coming, in a sense, out of Deming's work. Because Deming's assumption was you had to have personal responsibility. If you couldn't have personal responsibility, you couldn't even begin. So that's one of the reasons we emphasize it so much in the course. That, that, in, that in his vision of America, the first thing he'd say to every person in welfare is, what are you going to do about it? The first thing he'd say to every addict and alcoholic is, what are you going to do about it? Now, we'll help, but you tell us what you're going to do first. And so you, you start with this very deeply ingrained sense of personal responsibility. And again, I mentioned the wagon train because in a lot of critiques of American civilization, there's a tendency to overstate the lone cowboy, which, by the way, is nonsense. I mean, you, you never, almost never had lone cowboys. You had, her, you had herds which were herded by cowboys who operated as a team. But if you think about this whole notion of the lone gunfighter in the middle of the street, that is an almost pathological vision of the 19th century. There were very few loners. There were a lot, there was tremendous individualism. But it was individualism within groups. It was individualism within the wagon train. Individualism within the community. Individualism within the group of people herding the cows. And he had very individualistic personalities, but he had people who were very used to working as a team. And it's, a, it's very important to understand that. It's individualism with a capacity to then deliberately surrender your individuality to be part of a team knowing you can then leave the team and go back to being an individual, and you'll form a new team. But it's America as a sequence of teams, not America as, as this, this, uh, this anomic individual who is totally isolated. I mean, Jeremiah Johnson, 
was a very rare person. And he's, he's the mountain man. There's a movie by, with Robert Redford. He's a real figure, but he's very rare in the 19th century. There are very few people who are that alone. And the real model was the cavalry patrol, uh, the wagon train, the community of uh, the small town. Now, in this context, Deming, who was born in Indiana but raised in Cody, Wyoming, born in 1900, uh, is, I think, in many ways, in his own life, the personification of those co kind of core American values and core American behaviors. So what I'd like you to do for a minute is uh, take a look at Dr. Uh, Dr. W. Edwards Deming and his life. 